question. Ja. Szerintem teremben lehet hallani ez, de az csak a felvétel miatt Igen, kell, úgyhogy azért pont. Jó. És uh, szóval az előadás nyelve nem azért nem magyar, mert nem tudok magyarul, persze, hogy tudok magyarul, csak nem tudok a tudományról beszélni magyarul. Úgyhogy uh, ezt uh, ezért így könnyebb. De gondolom mindenki érti. Meg uh, kik a kutatók itt? Kik azok ilyen kutató háttérrel vannak? Hm? Hát akkor mindenki. De mondjuk téged ismerlek meg a Pétert is. Jó, csak azért, mert hogyha valami nem világos, akkor mindig állítsatok meg, úgyhogy jó. Tehát a, a, So my lab has been studying um, breast tumor heterogeneity or diversity. And then the uh, question is like, why, um, what type of diversity can you study in tumors? Um, so there are uh, heterogeneity between tumors in different patients, like each patient has a kind of unique tumor. This is called the intertumor heterogeneity. But even the different tumors within the same patient uh, at the same time or different times could be different, meaning like a primary tumor and a metastatic lesion in the same patient can be divergent. But then what I will discuss today is the within one tumor or intratumor heterogeneity, which means that even in one tumor of a patient at given time, there is a heterogeneity of cancer cells. And uh, this is actually one of the major, or actually the key differences between normal and cancer cells, that cancers are um, heterogeneous. Um, one of the reasons for this, because um, the genome, the DNA of the cancer cells is very unstable. So there is an abnormal genotype which is in contrast to the normal genotype of the normal cells. The tissue architecture, which is in normal tissues, there is a very defined architecture, uh, whereas in the tumors, it's completely distorted. And then in part of these um, genetic, epigenetic, and microenvironmental heterogeneity, the network architecture within the cells, uh, meaning like the interactions among genes and what kind of uh, 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 transcripts are expressed, is very uh, messy or noisy in tumors in contrast to the very clean and uh, robust uh, in the normal tissues. And basically anything that we can measure in tumors, it tends to be heterogeneous, meaning like, you know, the, uh, the tumor cells can be genetically heterogeneous. They can have a different uh, response to the treatment, drug response, or epigenetically and proliferation um, can be also very different. Um, so actually, if we look at the evolution, hmm? yes, epigenetic. Um, so epigenetic is uh, hereditary, but non-genetic. So for example, every cell in our body is genetically the same in normal tissue, but, um, but they are different. You know, you have a skin cell, a brain cell. So what dif differentiates them is an epigenetic program. It's basically during development, you establish normal epigenetic programs for each normal cell. Um, and it's very stable for normal tissues. That's why we don't become an amoeba or something. Uh, but in cancer cells, this can be distorted. You know, cancers don't have a function. So they can start to acquire phenotypes which normally would not occur in any cell in the body. Um, anything else? Not clear on here? OK. Uh, so if we consider how tumors evolve or progress during uh, disease progression, um, traditionally, people thought that uh, you know, there is a mutation in a, in a cell, and then um, the, the clone, you know, this clone expands and then acquires additional mutations. So basically, this is kind of a clonal succession model, meaning like there is always a dominant cancer cell population that drives the tumor. So this has been a traditional view, but in the evolutionary biology view and more, um, more and more experimental data actually suggest there is a very high degree of heterogeneity in a tumor, clonal heterogeneity. So a clone is a, is a progeny of a cell. That's what we call a clone. And this can be, um, these clones can be changing during the tumor progression and also they, they can interact with the one another in the tumor and influence the phenotype of the tumor. 
So why is it important to study heterogeneity within tumors? Um, so from a clinical perspective, it can be a very important uh, biomarker that predicts uh, the probability of the patient to respond to treatment or to progress to metastatic disease. Because it's kind of just like in evolution, it's like if you have higher diversity, the likelihood that a cancer cell is not responding to treatment is much higher than if you have a homogeneous population. Um, it's also a good a tool to trace back tumor evolution because you know, in patients we always have a tumor when they are diagnosed, so we can't really tra follow them over time, at least not in the early stages. Um, and, but based on this heterogeneity of clones within tumor, we can predict the probable evolution that occurred up to that point. It's also useful to, to, to develop better models of cancer because you know, anytime we want to test a new treatment strategy, we need some kind of experimental model, but many of the animal studies are not really predictive of um, clinical responses in patients, and that could be because they are not reproducing this heterogeneity of the cancer cells. And then, importantly, it's also required for the design of optimal and individualized therapy because we have to understand what are the cancer cell populations within a tumor uh, in order to target them. Because if you have a treatment that targets only a subset of the cancer cells, then um, the patient's not going to respond, and not because, not because the, uh, the treatment doesn't work, but because there is a subset of cancer cells that don't, are not targeted by this particular treatment. So what are the measures, how we can measure intratumor heterogeneity? So this can be used in different techniques, um, like genetic heterogeneity, meaning like differences in the DNA. Um, we can actually nowadays sequence the whole genome, like there are, sequencing became so advanced and so relatively cheap that we can have every single nucleotide, or almost every single nucleotide in a cancer cells, and some of these could be even done in a single cell level. Nowadays, you can even sequence a single cancer cell. Um, so those are those uh, genome-wide methods. There is also like in situ methods, which we use um, in, in some of these slides that I will show you, which is, uh, some of them is called FISH. It's fluorescent in situ hybridization. It's basically looking at chromosomal regions to see how many copies are there. I will show you slides on these and in situ PCR. Epigenetic heterogeneity, again, there are genome-wide techniques now that we can bring down the chromatin and then see at the modifications or in situ methods for this also. And phenotypic heterogeneity, we can look at the transcripts in the cell with RNA-seq. It's a technique to look at every gene that's expressed in a cell or look at in situ um, techniques again. Or the combined technique that we have been using is we call it immunofish or ifish. Um, because you're looking, we're looking at the phenotype of the cells and also genetic uh, uh, heterogeneity using fish. And I will show you examples so everything will be more clear. So my lab has been studying this heterogeneity in breast tumors for, for many years now. And initially we started out looking at the um, purifying cells with different differentiation states in the tumor. So there are some cells that seem to be uh, more stem cell looking, stem cell looking like poorly differentiated, whereas others are more differentiated luminal cells, and they have markers that we can uh, use for their purification, like CD44 is a marker of the more stem cell looking cells, and CD24 is a marker of more differentiated luminal cells. So we purify these cells from different tumors, and then in this left panel is the clustering of the gene expression profiles. The red ones are genes that are highly expressed in one cell type or the other. So you see like we see two very distinct groups. So these cells are very different from gene expression patterns. And then this is an example of fish um, where we, this doesn't project that well, um, but basically these little dots here are the copy number for a particular loci, like this one is 1Q21. And what we noticed here is that in this population, there is only two copies, whereas in this CD24 population, there are multiple copies suggesting, yes? Sorry, I just have a question. Why stem cells? Why do there be so few breast cancers? Oh. Why, why did you choose that? So there's luminal, epithelial, transient, and obvious. But well, these are both cancer cells. So these are breast cancer cells. But one of them has a more stem cell-like phenotype. 
uh, the other one has a more differentiated thin type. So these are not real stem cells in a, in a functional way. These are just cancer cells with a phenotype of a more stem cell looking cell versus it's more differentiated. It, it, so yes, all so all kind of it's actually all types of tumors. You can have poor, the, when the pathologists look at a tumor and they can call like poorly differentiated tumor. So molecularly that means that it's a more stem cell looking okay. phenotype. Okay. You know, poor, poor differentiation means that it's not um, differentiated, so it has a phenotype of a more embryonic cell. It doesn't mean that it's like that, but, you know, it's, it's really like a scale, you know, in, in um, these tumors, like, you can have a very fully differentiated cell and not differentiated at all, and then you have a kind of linear, almost linear gradient in between, and that's what's so difficult in cancers, because you can be anything, you know, they can express any gene. Um, from the genome, yes. Fish. So this is a fish. Uh, so it's like um, we take a chromosomal probe. So in this is a one region of a chromosome, one Q twenty one. We label it with a fluorescent um, nucleotide, um, and then we can hybridize it to cells. So this is a nuclei of a cancer cell. These are the chromosomes. You see, this is a metaphase spread and then it hybridizes to this particular region. And you see here, you only have two copies, which is normal for each chromosome, you're supposed to have two copies. But here, there are multiple. So it has a gain of a copy. So fish, yeah, this is the fish. So and then I'm, yes, it's a method. <laughs> yes, fluorescent in situ hybridization. So you have a DNA probe that's fluorescently labeled and then um, hybridize it to uh, nuclei, or I will show you later on tissue sections from tumors, and then you count the dots. Uh, we use a confocal microscope to, to do that, to take the image of the picture, and then um, you can count the dots in each cell. It's also an animal, the fish. <laughs> <laughs> I will show you some animal pictures also. So this particular case in this early study, we looked at the uh, progression of DCIS to invasive cancer. DCIS is ductal carcinoma in situ. It's an early stage cancer. So in the breast, you have the milk ducts. Um, cancer starts usually in the duct. And then when it's still growing inside the duct, so it's not invading the surrounding tissue, it's called intraductal carcinoma or ductal carcinoma in situ. So those usually are har harmless in a way that you just take them out with surgery and then patients are 99% of the time, they are perfectly fine. Once they invade, like they get out of the ducts and they invade the surrounding tissue, that's when the tumors can spread and spread to other parts of the body. So in this study, we were looking at what are the changes that occur between DCIS and invasive tumor. And in this particular sample, you can see that in this population, the CD44 cells, there was a small clone within a tumor that had this copy number gain, these red dots or copy number gain for a particular locus. And then in an invasive tumor, it became the dominant clone. It became, you see now all of the cancer cells have this uh, copy number gain. So this shows that this, this cancer cell with this copy number gain had an advantage and it became the dominant cancer cell population in the, in the tumor. So then um, while we were doing these studies, I also um, visited the Galapagos Islands. The very first time I went, and I will show some slides from there. These are my pictures. So very first time I went in 2004, December. And the reason why it's relevant to this study, of course, this is not breast, but I read this book, The Beak of the Finch, which is a great book. It's a, it's a kind of popular science book, so anybody who's not a scientist can read it. But it really explains evolution really well. So then I read that book, and then I became more interested in uh, understanding evolution and what are the really the methods that people use. So I read this other book, this more complicated one, measuring biological diversity because, so this is like ecology, basically. Ecologists use diversity measures in ecosystems, but basically the same measures could be used with, uh, in tumors. And then we started a collaboration with Francis Kamikor, who's uh, actually a mathematician, um, and it's really um, have been working on mathematical modeling of cancer. And then Mitat Gunan, who's a, a biostatistician, and I will show you like all these subsequent studies have been a collaboration at, between the three of us. 
and then I went back to the Galapagos a uh, few more times, and um, I mean, unfortunately, it looks like nobody's here from the group, but we actually had a group of uh, scuba divers who we went together and visited and rented a boat together and um, had a great uh, time. And I will just show you, so the Galapagos Islands is in the Pacific Ocean, like uh, you have to fly to Ecuador, it's part of Ecuador. And then this is the islands. These are small islands, volcanic islands, but they are beautiful. And I just show you a few pictures just to make you, ha anybody has been there? No, well you have to go there. No, not that if you go through people, local people. But anyway, the first time I went with a Sierra Club, and after that I became friends with the locals, and I learned Spanish. And then if you book a boat through them, it's like half the price than if you go through travel agencies. So if anybody wants to go, I can get you there in half the price than what you do otherwise. <laughs> but then when we actually charted a boat, so we can charter the boat ourselves, 16 people, and then you basically, you just split the cost to 16, and there is no, you know, no travel agency fee. But anyway. It's beautiful. So I just show you a few quick slides just to make you want to go there. And uh, these are slides that I arranged. Like this is the um, like a geology of the islands, and each one is a different island. And there is uh, some active volcanoes there. It's really spectacular. Um, and I've been pretty much to all of the islands now. These are scuba diving pictures. Whoever is a diver, it's great. You have um, uh, amazing life. Lots of sharks, whale sharks, hammerheads. Beautiful starfish, um, turtles, giant turtles, sea turtles, and the crabs, um, marine iguanas, which is, uh, that's a unique species only found in the Galapagos. And every island is actually slightly different. So you can tell based on the color um, which island they are from. These are regular land iguanas, then the frigate birds and some other birds, um, boobies blue-footed boobies and uh, albatross, um, Nazca boobies, uh, and the red-footed boobies. So you see, you see like this one has really red feet. And these have really blue feet. These are the red-footed booby, blue-footed booby. This is a waved albatross, which is only nest in the Galapagos, uh, Española island. And then these are the other types of boobies. They're really beautiful. So anyway, coming back to science. So basically, um, you can use a uh, measuring biodiversity in ecosystem using this Shannon index of diversity, which is basically you count how many species you see and how many individuals within each species. So you count how many frigate birds you see, how many blue-footed boobies, turtles, when you go on a walk, and based on this, there is this equation, which is a, it's a pretty simple equation. You just add up, yes. Which one? Yes. Yeah. But <laughs> anyway, but basically, you, you can, this is called the Shannon Index of Diversity, or there's a Simpson Index of Diversity also, which is slightly different formula. But um, basically, it's, um, it, it can be used as a score to measure diversity in ecosystems and also in, tum in tumors. So basically what we did call a species in a cancer s is a cancer cells with some unique features. So for example, cancer cell with a particular copy number gain for a locus that you could call is a different species than the one with a, uh, another kind of copy number gain. So I'll show you some examples. So then we did this study, uh, again this is still the DCIS study, when we calculated this diversity score or Shannon index for the different cell populations and the different tumors. And then in breast cancer, there are different subtypes of breast cancer, meaning like, you know, categorized how they look in different patients. And when we look at these different subtypes, we saw that the different subtypes have different diversity, such as the basal or triple negative seems to be always high diversity. The y-axis is the diversity index, and these are the tumors. Whereas these other subtypes, um, have sometimes low diversity, sometimes high. The reason why this is interesting, and this was not too many tumors, because basal-like or triple negative tumors in general have poor outcome. Um, they are spreading very quickly and they don't respond well to treatment, whereas the HER2 positive and luminal breast cancer tends to be, not always, but 
the majority tends to be more responsive to treatment. Then this kernel histogram of species abundance is another kind of measure that we can use that ecologists use. Here we put the x-axis is a particular feature of the species or so in this case we use the copy number ratio for the two cancer cells and the y-axis is the number of cells with that particular copy number ratio. So the reason uh, uh, to use this is because you can see that these four cell populations here that are have different phenotypes, they're very different. You can just tell by the shape of this curve that you see this, this, this tumor is very heterogeneous because it has like four different cell populations with very different properties, whereas... What, what, what is copy number? Copy number is the... Is the um, when we look at the, you know, that fish, what I showed, we're counting the copy number for a particular locus. Oh, and so it's within, a, within one cell there? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so the copy number ratio is within one cell. Yeah. We usually count the... So if you have a chromosome, every chromosome has a centromere. This is kind of the middle of the chromosome. And, um, and then there is the arm, long arm, short arm. And the probes are usually on the chromosomal arms. And then we do the centromeric probe, and then we take the ratio of the two. The reason is because um, this tells you the sometimes cancer cells can have many copies of the same chromosome. So in that case, the ratio would remain the same because um, it's just on haploidy. So it's a different kind of heterogeneity than if you gain a particular region. So, but you could do any kind of measure there. So the point is that this plot can tell you that this population looks fairly homogeneous, this tumor, whereas this one is very heterogeneous because we see at least four different populations of cancer cells. So I will, um, more recently, we apply this kind of uh, measures for tumors before and after chemotherapy uh, with a question of asking, you know, how tumors change during treatment. And this is a nicer picture now. You see that um, each cell, uh, this is each one is a different cell. You see, um, we can identify them based on this CD4424 combination. We can group them into four different phenotypes whether they are double positive or single positive or s double negative. And then within each cell, you can count these red dots and the uh, green dots. So this is basically, a, uh, one of them is a copy number for a particular locus like 8Q24, and then the SEP is the centromeric probe. So if you're counting in each cell, you're counting these dots, that will give you a number for how many back probes, how many SEP probes you have. And we do this in each of the four cell populations. So this way, we can get an overview of the genetic diversity in the tumor. And then we can also see within individual subpopulations are what is the genetic diversity. Yes? So how do you differentiate the Oh, because of the, um, it, this one is in a confocal microscope. Maybe here you see it better. Uh, so if you do high magnification picture, so the cell, these, these markers stain the cell membrane. So the blue color is the staining. Here the yellow color is the other marker. And then, um, you know, your our eye is never as good as the microscope because in a microscope we can kind of yes. do a measure, move it, and then put it on top of each other. So this is all done with a microscope. But basically this yellow color is a CD24 positive cell. The blue is more of the CD44. And then you can merge on top of each other and you can identify the cells. Yes? Yeah. So in this particular case for each of the four, so we have four cell populations. In each one we count in 100 to 200 cells. But sometimes not all cell population is present in each of the tumors, so you will see that. But otherwise, we're counting 100 to 200 minimum. So it's a lot of individual cell counting. Um, um, this not yet, but we're working on it now because this was one of the reasons it took. You know, it took a long time. We had 50 50 patients. Each one we had pre post treatment sample, so that's like 100 tumors, and within each one we counted um, at least. 800 cells. So I think Vanessa, who did this, counted that she counted like 26,000 individual cancer cells mm -hmm. by the time we completed this study. So now what we're doing, and if anybody has any, uh, you know, like there are people who work on image processing software to uh, automate it, because basically you can teach the computer to recognize a cell, 
and then count the dots in a cell. So the only problem with a computer that you have to, the computer doesn't know what a cell is. So you have to say, where is the nuclei? So then you will have to counter stain with DAPI. DAPI is a stain for DNA. And then, and then the computer can focus on the blue, blue circles because those are the nuclei and then count the red and, and uh, green dots. Um, so we're working on that, and I think there really is a way to automate it. Um, I will show you later on some s images how we kind of converted the microscopic images into computerized images, and then, you know, it's easy to count. So what image one? Oh, this one? Oh, I think this is like a 100x. 100x magnification, so 100x uh, objective. Yeah, this is about 10 microns. It's to about 10 microns average. Yeah, so it's a um, one average cell. So I just uh, I will not sh actually go over every single side, but here one of the points we looked at. So we looked at this channel index of diversity uh, in the different tumor subtypes and different patients. So each dot is a tumor and the coloring is the subtype of breast cancer which I already you know discussed there is like hormone receptor positive and negative ones and then if we look at before and after treatment samples actually um, the diversity seems to remain fairly constant within one tumor this plot doesn't express it that well but it remains fairly constant but then what we saw that the HER2 positive subtype the purple one seemed to have a higher diversity for this particular locus 8Q24, but it's not changing significantly. So if you look at the scale, they are very high diversity on a one to four scale. Uh, one would be like uh, very low diversity, but none of them had that low score. Um, they usually around two to three, and then they remain two to three, and the HER2 is more like three to four, and it remains three to four, meaning like a diversity doesn't change. change. Of course, it doesn't mean that the cancer cells, cancer doesn't change, um, but uh, they, di they remain diverse. And I show you some kernel plots. Uh, so this is looking at what I explained, like um, looking at the uh, um, copy number ratio and then in a four different populations. Whenever there is no plot, that means that that cell type is not there. And you see that uh, the shape of the curve, again, in this particular patient, the before treatment, and after treatment seems to be very different. So that says that the cell populations actually change. So they, the diversity remained the same, but the relative distribution of the cell populations and the copy number, it did change. Um, and what we found that actually, if we're looking at these four different cell types, you know, like the four different colors are the four different cell types, the frequency seems to be changing in a way that the the red ones, the CD44 positive cells, seems to become um, decrease after treatment, and then the CD24 seem to be increasing after treatment. And this just shows the this was actually true in each of the cell types. And um, this could be this was a chemotherapy treatment. So chemotherapy in general targets proliferating cells. So we looked at cell proliferation in the four different cell populations. Um, because, you know, if the chemotherapy kills one cell preferentially than the other, it could mean that that cell was a faster proliferating one. And when we looked at the proliferation in a four different cell population by staining for this uh, green marker, which stains proliferating cells, we found that these red cells, the CD44 cells, were the most proliferative ones uh, compared to the blue cells. And this was actually true in all of the tumor subtypes, the red cells had the highest proliferation rate, and it usually went down after treatment in almost all of the tumors, except a few exceptions. And then these blue cells, the CD24 cells, which are the more differentiated cells, those were the slower proliferating ones. Hmm? Chemotherapy? Oh, um, this was actually a mixture um, of different types of chemotherapy, not Everybody was treated with the exact same ones. It's usually, for breast cancer, it's usually uh, doxorubicin, taxanes, sometimes also got 5-FU. Um, it's kind of this combination. Okay, so now this is how we kind of converted uh, microscopic images into digitized images on the, on the, on the um, computer. 
So what we wanted to see here is like how the topology of the tumor changed during treatment because um, this way we can look at, you know, basically we took this uh, image and then each cell is, um, uh, has a score for the phenotypes, so the four different colors, you know, they colored according to that. And then for each cell we score for the genotype, which is the copy number variation. So therefore you can ask questions is like are the same of the cells of the same phenotype, like the red cells, are they clustering together or not? Are they changing, these clusters changing after treatment or not? Are the cells next to each other genetically the same or not? And how this may change during treatment. So that's what we call the topology of the tumor. Um, the reason why it's interesting because the neighboring cells uh, within a tumor could influence each other's ability to respond to treatment and also the interaction with the stroma. So this white space, of course, tumors are not in a white space, but there is a stroma or a matrix surrounding them, a connective tissue, and that interaction could also influence whether they respond to treatment or not. So each tumor we analyze this way, and based on these very colorful pictures, like this particular case is a before treatment for copy number and after treatment. So you can see right away that you have many red cells here, meaning like high copy number gain here, and almost none after treatment in this particular tumor. Whereas in this other patient, there was low copy number gain, and it became very high after treatment. So you see it's a very nice kind of easy way to see this. In terms of the phenotype, um, in this particular tumor, you were many red cells, which are common in triple negative, and it seems to go down a little bit, but not that dramatically. Whereas in this HER2 positive tumor, there were blue cells, more blue cells, and then became even more blue cells after the tumor, so phenotype. So this kind of gives you these nice pictures. And then, and then I mentioned that we can ask questions like other adjacent cells are related to each other genetically or phenotypically and so on, and we saw some interesting um, differences such as neighboring cells tend to be genetically divergent after treatment and phenotypically more related after treatment, which is kind of, we don't always know exactly what it means, but this is kind of an observation. So it could mean that, you know, you, you increasing genetic instability with the treatment or that the cells migrate within a tumor and they seem to be more diverse. But then the reason why this topology is also um, useful is because uh, with Francisca, um, we could, or they developed a mathematical simulation of tumor growth during treatment. So basically, we had the um, topology from at the start of the treatment, and then we also had the topology at the end of the treatment. And then they could design a computer program that would tell like how many times the cells, which cells divide, and how many times, which, which is the fraction of the cells that die during chemotherapy and how the tumor would look in different days of the chemotherapy. So they ran this uh, computational um, model, which is actually, we have a video, I don't know if I can show it, but we took snapshots of this video of different treatment, different days of treatment. So you see like this particular tumor starts out like this and then it changes during the treatment and it becomes like this on a, when they stop the treatment. Uh, and the reason why this is interesting, not just because of the, it's kind of uh, cool to watch the video, the cells dividing and dying, but uh, you know, during um, treating a patient, uh, ideally you don't wanna wait like three, four months to find out that your treatment is not gonna work in somebody. Um, uh, it would be good to know early on who's likely to respond, who's not likely to respond, because if somebody is not likely to respond, as many of the patients in this particular study, then um, you want to start some different treatment uh, before you know it's end of the treatment of this particular thing. So what we're envisioning, and this is what we're working on now with Francisca, is to um, try to take these tumors from clinical trials and also from studies in xenografts that we're doing uh, with mice, is to, to see um, how the tumors respond to treatment and build mathematical models that would tell you this particular tumor with this particular cell population and cell division rates is likely to respond to this treatment the best based on the simulation or computer simulation uh, model. And um, I think the reason why that could be interesting because right now, um, 
I mean, there is, breast cancer is actually one of the most treatable cancers in a way that, you know, depending on what subtype you have, but most of the time the doctors are actually making a fairly rational decision in terms of how to treat. But even so, some of the subtypes, like the triple negative subtype, there is not really a targeted therapy, meaning like not really like an endocrine therapy or herceptin therapy. So it's pretty much uh, chemotherapy, and chemotherapy doesn't always work, or a particular chemotherapy doesn't always work. So it would be better to come up with more, you know, rational decisions for to how to treat a particular patient. Yes. No, no. This is on a. So the simulation is based on the two endpoints, you know, the beginning and start. I can actually show it. I have it. Yes. No, I mean, the, the plan is that uh, the pretreatment sample um, would give enough information to predict uh, um, how the patient, how the tumor will evolve during that particular treatment or which one would be the best way to treat it. Um, so it's not, not, I mean, some of it, some of the models we're building based on, based on, um, based on the um, sinograph studies, but others we're doing based on, I cannot access my Dropbox for some reason. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to show you, but I don't know how to show you this kind of a video. It's um, well anyway, it's a kind of a just a video showing the cells dividing. Um, but it's um, yeah, this this one for example, this one is an example. I show you. Oops. So you see, like each cell is, uh, is there are the four dif different phenotypes, and we put in different proliferation rates for the different cell types based on the proliferation index that we measured. And then we also put in certain apoptosis rate. Apoptosis is when the cells die. And then you can run this program and see how the tumor changes with time and during treatment. And then of course you can put in more parameters. We can put in like migration or you know like uh, other, other treatments could potentially target a particular cell population. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So this was uh, each patient. I think we had about 15 patients. Each one we um, validated and actually tested the simulation on how does it fit the data. Meaning, like we started the simulation based on the day zero, and then we asked, you know, did it match what we predict in a computer on day 150 when they collected the sample from the patient? Would it match the actual picture that we see? So that's how we kind of validated it. Mm-hmm, yeah, no, it's, um, but anyway, I, I kind of, um, I have, we have many more of these, but it's basically, uh, in a way, because, you know, patients, you cannot sample so many times during treatment, and um, we think that this way we could actually predict how the tumors evolve um, during treatment. All right, let me stop this. Okay, so coming back to the clinical relevance of this heterogeneity again. Um, so these were patients who got neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So neoadjuvant chemotherapy means um, that the patient is diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, and if they have a large size tumor, they treat it before surgery to kind of shrink the tumor. Um, and then some people actually have a complete response to treatment, so that's called a complete response or CR, and then others have stable disease or partial response. This is the pathologist defines it based on how the tumor changes. And then of course the pre and post treatment samples can only come from patients who did not have a complete response. If you have a complete response then there is a tumor is gone, uh, which is a good thing. Those patients actually have a good long term outcome in this particular case. But then we wanted to see is like how would the diversity of the tumor predict response to treatment? So we have this pretreatment diversity for these three different groups of patients, the ones that had complete response, partial response, or stable disease. So you see that the patients that had complete response had the lowest diversity. 
whereas the ones that had partial response or stable disease, they had higher diversity um, after treat I mean before treatment, and this was statistically significant. And then the ones who didn't respond, actually the diversity remained a bit about the same or a little bit even increased for the HER2 positive um, cases. So this kind of shows that uh, if we're looking at a tumor of a patient and we see high diversity, that would predict that somebody is less likely to respond to treatment and probably any kind of treatment. Um, because again, like it makes sense, if you have a very diverse cell population, then um, those are not likely to you know, respond or there is always a probability of a cancer cell that is not likely to respond. So I will cover one other story and then I, I think I will stop there. Um, another diversity we looked at is metastatic diversity. So unfortunately, um, sometimes some patients don't respond to treatment and they progress to metastatic disease. And then um, fortunately in breast cancer, this almost always occurs long time or you know after treatment. So in, in a way, if we want to study what is the natural history of the progression of metastatic progression, um, this kind of samples would not tell us because these are recurrences after treatment. So if you consider you want to study how tumors evolve naturally, then you would have to not treat the patient. But of course, you cannot do that. You know, somebody who has a cancer, they get treatment. Um, so therefore, we wanted to use another set of samples that were collected prior to treatment. So we collected lymph node metastasis, which is not exactly the same as a liver or brain med, but it's still kind of collected before any treatment. So we can study how the tumor looks in the, in the local organ where it developed versus when it's metastatized to some other part of the body. So we did this study, and I will here I show you only a few slides. But one... Um, um, kind of picture that I like to highlight is that this particular patient had many metastatic lesions. I'm only showing two, one in the spleen and one in the lung. And the color of the cells, you see like this is a cell, these are yellow mostly, so they're positive for CD24. In the spleen, they are mostly blue, so they are CD44. And then if you look at the copy number in the lung, there are many copy numbers for this. Whereas here, it's not so many, or actually also varies from cell to cell. So what I'd just like to emphasize here, uh, the reason why metastatic disease is so deadly and so difficult to treat, because every single lesion in the patient can be different. And you know, you're trying to treat it one way, and it's very difficult to, to kill every single cancer cell at this point, because they are, even just looking at these few markers, they seem to be very diverse. Um, so here again, we calculated the Shannon index of diversity in the distant metastatic lesions, which are the green ones, and then also the primary tumors and lymph nodes. Um, and we calculated diversity for different loci. So these are different chromosomal loci. And what seems to be fairly clear that the green ones, so the distant metastatic lesions always have higher diversity than the primary tumor and the lymph node, which is, in a way, it's expected. Yes. No, no. Surprise. surprise. Um, yeah, so, um, I mean, I don't know if it's expected or unexpected, but that's what we see. It's kind of uh, expected in a way that these patients who had the distant metastatic lesions, they are basically failed multiple lines of therapy. So these patients, some of them were treated like four or five years, and uh, they still died of the disease. These were from autopsy samples. So um, that means that they had a bad tumor. So it kind of makes sense that those were very, um, uh, yes? Okay, so let me say why I was surprised now that you were commenting that you had a non tumor breast cancer and you see that in the tumor breast. So what I was thinking that some type of function cells don't travel to the other parts of the yes. body and just on top of the mm -hmm. cell. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in in uh, in some ways, it would make sense that you know the metastatic lesion starts from one clone, and you would be less heterogeneous. But if you imagine at that time, so first of all, what we have been seeing and others have been seeing that the primary tumor, when it's metastatic, you could actually have multiple clones 
leaving the tumor at one time, and the metastatic lesion may start from a cluster of cells, not just a single cell. Uh, so that's one thing that you could basically, you already have like four or five cells. Hmm? They travel together. Yeah. Yeah. Some. <laughs> yes. So you can travel in clusters, that's one way, and then you cre create heterogeneity. And the other thing is, by the time, you know, the metastatic lesion starts from a small few cells, but by the time they become um, detectable and, uh, and uh, you know, problematic, they have to undergo many, many divisions. So during that divisions, each time the cell would divide, you could generate much more heterogeneity because they're genetically unstable. Uh, and, um, and it, that's why, uh, but what I like to just point out, because so many times people feel like the doctors are not doing their job of not treating everybody and not curing everybody, but if you think about the problem, you know, how can you, you have like 10 to the 9th or 10 to the 12th cancer cells in a body or even more when you have a metastatic lesion, and the probability that some will be resistant to treatment is really high. Um, the bottom line is that you want to have early diagnosis and early treatment because once it becomes so full-blown, it's usually very difficult to treat. Uh, but then this plot here, the other thing what was, um, I don't know, surprising or not surprising is that the diversity of the different metastatic lesions in the distant metastatic lesions were not very different, whereas the primary and the lymph node was more different, not every single time, but in, in, in some of the cases, like if you're looking at the distance, you know, diversity difference between primary lymph node versus two different distant metastatic lesion, uh, the primary lymph node seems to be more different than the two different metastatic lesions, which again kind of may be expected because the distant metastatic lesions evolve during treatment. The body, you know, the patients were exposed to treatment, so maybe you're selecting for similarities in a way that would be resistant whereas the primary lymph node was collected before any treatment. So they kind of more reflect the natural spreading of the cancer cells. I mean, I don't know, you know, of course we can s explain it in either way, but that's what we see. But then when we looked at the phenotype, meaning like these four cell types that we, I was using the four different colors, the two different metastatic lesions, distant metastatic lesions, were more likely to be different for the phenotypes than the primary and lymph node. So this shows like the change in cell frequency. And in the primary lymph node, there is very little change and in only in a few cases. Whereas in the distant mats, almost each one of them is different. And that kind of correlates with this picture I showed you that one is more blue, the other one is more yellow. Whereas in the lymph node and primary, they almost always have the same color. It's kind of visually to explain this. Okay, so let me summarize uh, what I was just trying to show you. So what we see is basically this intratumor diversity varies according to tumor subtypes. So I was showing you that the HER2 positive ones seem to have higher diversity for this. And it remains fairly constant during this now adjuvant treatment, but again this constant in people who were non-responsive to treatment because those are the ones that we had pre-post-treatment samples. And the more diverse tumors were less likely to respond to treatment and this topologic distribution of the cells would also changing and chemotherapy selects for slow growing cells, which again was expected. And the distant metastatic lesions were more diverse um, than the others. So this one I'm gonna skip because this one it gets into a xenograph model, which uh, may be a bit too complicated to explain. And I just wanna go to the acknowledgement slide of the lab, um, and then, uh, so this work was basically the older immunofish that I showed you was done by Vanessa Almendro with Hee Jun Kim and So Young Park are two pathologists who uh, will help her. And then um, Doris and Andre has done this xenograph uh, work which where we're trying to study the functional interactions among clones, but that part I skipped because that would be another hour to discuss. <laughs> Uh, and then we have Francisco, I already mentioned, we have been working with her. Uh, she's also Dana Farber, and we have other collaborators, many, many collaborators around the world that help with the tissue samples. Or Shale Witzkowicz was at the MIT, and now he's back in uh, Weizmann, helped develop this topology algorithm for the tumors. And Mitat is the um, bioinformatician who uh, 
uh, I mean, biostatistician who have uh, the analysis also. Okay. So, köszönöm a figyelmet. Ez volt. Remélem azért valamennyire érthető volt. <laughs> Uh-huh. annál a beteknél bizonyos sejtek jelentek meg a lépben, bizonyos sejtek az időben, akkor ez azt jelenti, hogy később akár a metastázis szerint lehetne a terápiát uh-huh. ö- Igen. betegre szabni. Igen. Csak hát az a baj, hogy általában um, főleg ezek a daganatok, amik nagyon metastatikusak, nagyon sok helyre mennek az agyba, tüdőbe, um, májba. Szóval nagyon nem is kezelik, olyan komolyan palliatív. Nem kezelik. Kezelik Nekünk vannak olyan betegeink, akik 5-6 évet túlélnek. Még ilyennel is, ilyen metasztázissal is. Igen. Nem mindenki, sajnos, de valamelyik fajtát jó kezelés. És itt akkor úgy tudom értettem, hogy ez viszont különbözik betegről betegre. Tehát ez nem Igen. Az, hogy előveszel egy következő beteget, akkor az ő tüdejében ugyanez a Igen. sárga lesz a szívű. Hát ez másfajta lesz. Minden betegben más. És azért olyan nehéz uh, kezelni, mert például, a, hát ez, például ez két különböző metasztatik uh, um, tumor, de ennek a betegnek, ezeknek legtöbb ilyen, mert ezek nagyon, uh, legtöbb ezeknek, ezeknek a betegeknek nagyon gyorsan meghalt, 5-6 éven belül a diagnózistól. Tehát ezek nagyon rossz fajta rákok voltak, és uh, ilyen autopsiba, tehát ilyen... Uh, jelentkeztek ilyen klinikai kísérletre, hogy amikor tudták, hogy meghalnak, akkor oda engedték, hogy az összes medasztadik lézet. Úgy kaptuk ezt, és azt tudom, hogy némelyiknek vagy 10-15 volt. Tehát mindenhol gyakorlatilag. És akkor belegondolsz, hogy az mind ilyen, mind különböző valamennyire, nagyon nehéz kezelni. Sokféle, sokféle, ja. Hát megvan nekünk, mi tudjuk az összes betegről, hogy hogy voltak kezelve. Tehát a legtöbbje kapott legalább három-négy féle kezelést, csak nem reagált. Vagy reagált, és akkor recurred, tudod, visszajött a danganat. Egy ideig reagál. Egy ideig reagál, utána nem. De hát ez megint... Van, a, van aki egy-két évig, van aki... Ja. De egyébként az evolúcióból azt is azon is jó elgondolkodni, hogy az mindig arra szelektál, ami abba a, külön, az a, abba a környezetbe nő a legjobban. Tehát például, amikor kezelünk valakit, akkor azok a sejtek nőnek a legjobban, akiknek abban a tehát kezelés alatt van előnyük. És időnként, ha megállítják a kezelést, akkor azok lassabban nőnek. Mert kevesebb az a szelekciós a szelekció. Úgyhogy azért szeretnénk ezeket így jobban uh, tanulmányozni, mert ezeket, ha, ha még a mostani, tehát nem is fedezünk fel úgy, hogy szereket, csak amiket tudunk, hogy hogy lehet alkalmazni, ha azokat is jobban alkalmaznánk, úgyhogy jobban megértjük, hogy hogy változik a daganat, meg hogy a legjobb, milyen uh, sorozatba, vagy milyen dózisba a legjobb kezelni a betegeket, még azok azzal is lehet eredményt elérni. Igen. Igen, igen. Uh, igen, hát a uh, fluorescent imaging, tehát vannak ilyen luciferase, luciferase a uh, hm? optika. Igen. Azt nem, nem mutattam meg, uh, arról nincs is képem, de például itt van, például ez GFP meg RFP, az a mert itt például azt csináltuk, most nem akartam úgy végigmenni, de azt néztük meg, hogy, hogy így, ha így mesterségesen generálunk ilyen tumorokat, amik monoklonálisak, ezek azok, vagy poliklonálisak, azok hogy viselkednek az egerekbe. 
és akkor itt végül is azt találtuk, hogy a polikronálisak nagyon gyorsan nőnek, ezek, ezek, és nagyon hamar metastatizálnak, ez a, mutatja, hogy egy-két hét alatt, nagyon gyorsan. És akkor ezzel csináltunk ilyen, um, tehát a um, luciferase az imaging, hogy láttuk, hogy hova mennek a sejtek, mert ezek így meg vannak jelölve RFP-vel, meg GFP-vel, meg a luciferase-del. Nem, ezek erre, nem, az állatban van. In vivo. Az a luciferase, azt lehet uh, in vivo. Ezt most már kivettük, ez itt már ki van béve, igen. Csak így mutatni, és... Uh, Ah, én nem akartam úgy végig menni rajta. <laughs> ja, so, um, van egy ilyen um, merrákonal, ami um, form, tehát ilyen um, daganatot, uh, it forms a tumor in mice, but it doesn't progress. So it remains like persistent size. This is what it shows. But it there has a very high turnover of the cells, very high proliferation rate and very high apoptosis rate. So we took this, And then we artificially expressed some genes, like we took like 50 genes implicated in cancer, and then derived these clones, which each clone is a clone that expresses a particular gene that thought to play a role in cancer. Stably overexpressed over a particular gene that's implicated in cancer. Like? MDA468. Uh, it's an interesting cell line, but it forms, really forms these tumors at very high penetrance, but they don't grow. They just grow to this size and remain like that. So the reason is because if we want to study clonal interactions and, you know, like um, competition among clones, we need a cell where it has high proliferation, so there is, you know, like change of the uh, cells, but it doesn't grow. And then we can ask questions. So what we did is like we generated these monoclonal or polyclonal tumors and then ask the question, which one is growing? So which one can grow out? And then what is the clonal composition of these tumors? And what is the tissue histology? So now I can, it's only a few slides, so I can actually show you. So one thing we found that the green lines are all the clones that did not drive the growth of the tumor. So the tumor remained exactly the same. And actually the majority of the genes is like that. Um, we had two, IL-11 and CCL5, that was able to drive the growth alone. Like if we put it in alone, was able to drive it. And then these purple ones are the polyclonal ones when we mixed like 20 clones together. And this one, uh, we actually. Yes, I, and then I show you because your next question will be if we remove IL 11, then they don't grow. But they still behave differently than IL 11 alone. Because if you look at the kinetics, it's much faster. And also, these are metastatic. Uh, IL-11 alone is never metastatic. We haven't seen any metastatic lesions. So um, it's very interesting uh, behavior because you have a, we have a clone that can drive the growth of the tumor, um, but it's not driving the metastatic behavior. But if you put into a mixture with other clones, then it becomes metastatic. And the polyclonal tumor is still dependent on this clone, but um, so it seems to be sufficient and required Yes. Polyclonal without IL-11 doesn't grow. That's this one here. No, it's not. What I mean that the IL-11 alone is growing, like this is this one, um, but it's not metastatic, whereas the polyclonal tumors are metastatic. This shows here the size. So if you see the parental cells, they're very, very tiny tumors. IL-11 tumors, they're really big, but they're not metastatic. Polyclonals are really big and they metastatic. Uh, and then um, this one we found another clone. It's one of the genes that seem to reproduce. So these two genes seem to reproduce, the somewhat reproduce the phenotype of the polyclonality. Um, and then here, I mean, I just might as well show this. So we looked at the clonal frequency of the cancer cells. And then basically what looks like that um, several clones were good competitors against the parental cells. That's the green bar here. But when we put them into polyclonal tumors, meaning like 20 different clones in one tumor, then um, they were suppressed. So none of them was able to outcompete the other. So that shows that there are two points. And if you look at IL-11, IL-11 was not a really good clonal competitor, but it was able to drive the growth of the tumor. So what the conclusion here is that the clonal expansion is, doesn't equal with tumor outgrowth meaning like a clone that expands in the tumor 
doesn't mean that that's necessarily driving the growth of the tumor. And then another one, we observed that there is an interference among clones that seem to be limiting each other's ability to take over the tumor. And this one I skipped. Um, this one I just mentioned that IL-11 seems to be driving the tumor by changing the microenvironment. So this one is staining for some matrix proteins. So you see this is the parental tumors, IL-11 tumors with, I mean, polyclonal tumors with IL-11, and this is IL-11. So you see these look very different. Which means IL-11 is away from the Yeah. Um, so it seems to be a paracrine effect. And we have many other pictures showing that the microenvironment of this tumor seems to be different. These brown cells are the <coughs> stroma cells, so these are not the cancer cells. So it looks like it recruits it to the tumor, and they seem to be more angiogenic. You know, if we count the blood vessels, these are these brown dots here. These IL-11 tumors are more angiogenic. And then this last data slide is actually um, what we wanted to see if IL-11, which drives the growth of the tumor, uh, but it's not a good clonal competitor. So what would happen if we mix the IL-11 clone with a clone that doesn't drive the growth of the tumor, but is a very good clonal competitor? Uh, so this is, is this experiment here. We had lock cell 3 which is another gene that was a very good clonal competitor, but those tumors are not big. They remain like the small size. So when we mix them together, first it looked like they have the same growth kinetics, but then when we took the tumors out, you see these are the log cell 3 tumors alone, very small. The IL-11, um, they're fairly big. When we mix with log cell 3, they also look big, but they look like a cyst. And if we cut it up, it's actually mostly dead cells. So they, what happened, and if we look at the clonal composition here, so if we have the IL-11 clone, of course we have a high fraction of IL-11 cells. When we put in with the log cell 3, these get outcompeted. So IL-11 clone disappeared from the tumor, and that seemed to have collapsed the angiogenesis, and the tumor basically died, um, which would be great to do in patients. Yes? So, I don't know, have you talked about uh, using the um, tumor Yes. No, it would be great, actually. Like, wh what would be great to do Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are two problems in that. Is like one is that this imaging is out in a harbor facility, so then you have to have your mice there, and it's also very expensive. For each mouse would be like $1,000, or I don't know how much to take a picture. But then the other thing, what would be really nice to do, because one of the problems with these clonality studies is that we can only look at clonality when we take out the tumor. But ideally, it would be nice to follow this as the tumor is growing in vivo. And I think in these models, maybe if you develop different colors for each clone, then you could follow this in vivo. I don't know if anybody has any ideas how you could have different colors for each clone and look at how the ratio changes. But anyway, so this is kind of an example when a good clone outcompetes the bad clone and the tumor actually collapses, so, yes? Sorry, no, for my question. So, um, you would be diagnostic on log cell 3, and how does the uh, clonality compare with your classification with mm -hmm. chest SRI? Um, so actually, right now, um, Heterogeneity is not yet usually reported, except for HER2 positive tumors. They started, started to report it because um, it looks like if you have a HER2 positive tumor and has a copy number gain for HER2, some patients have a very uniform copy number gain and all cancer cells have really high copies, whereas others have more heterogeneity, meaning like some cell has fewer copies, others have more and they seem to respond differently to treatment. Patients who have more heterogeneity, not surprisingly, um, not responding to treatment. Um, so I think it's getting <coughs> more and more, getting more attention um, to see how heterogeneity is, is there, particularly if you're targeting a particular gene, um, which you know many of these targeted therapies are per 
targeting a particular mutation, like HER2 is targeting the HER2 positive cells, some of the um, small molecule inhibitors of a mutant gene, again, targeting the cell with a mutant gene. But if not all the cells have that mutation, then you're not gonna, your treatment is not likely to work. So I think it's getting more and more attention. And I think, you know, some of these techniques that we're using, it's very easy to put into standard clinical practice because they are already using fish. So they're using fish to look at HER2 copy number. They're using immunostaining for hormone receptors or some other markers. And instead of just, you know, right now, for example, hormone receptors like ER, estrogen receptor, they're calling anybody who has 1% of the cancer cells positive, 1% in one biopsy, they're calling them positive, regardless whether it's 1% or 50% or 100%. And of course, I mean, it would make sense that somebody who has only 1% and 99% doesn't have hormone receptor, that tumor must be different than another one that has 100% of the cells expressing it. So I think there is more people are paying attention to it. And I think it's, um, you know, usually for clinical practice to change, you have to show that somebody who have low percent responds differently than has the high percent. And usually that requires large clinical trials to look at it. Um, Yeah, I mean, we already see it. What I mean is like it has to, has to be incorporated into regular um, clinical practice. But then also, I mean, you know, if you just tell somebody that you're not gonna respond to treatment is not really a good thing. I mean, it's a good thing in a way, but you have to be able to do something, you know. You have to have another option of better treatment for somebody who is not gonna respond to this treatment or that treatment or Maybe you would treat them more aggressively from the beginning if you see somebody has high heterogeneity. Um, and I think that that's would be useful. Yeah. Yeah, so, so there is a way that you could potentially kill the cancer cells that have, um, you know, deficient DNA repair, or they more sensitive to um, chromosome, you know, like uh, mitotic checkpoint controls. So there is some of that. What, what we would like to do is somehow um, kind of stop evolution, <laughs> like, you know, uh, decrease heterogeneity in the tumor um, by um, somehow treating some of the um, with some agents or combinations of agents that could homogenize the tumor in I some way. I, I thought I meant for some of the opposite, to try to, uh, to, try to uh, uh, affect those, uh, uh, I mean, try, try to uh, exploit the fact that the cell has genetic instability yes. uh, by, and, and try to reduce Push over the cliff. Yes. yes. <laughs> so that's also being tried, yeah, because they, in a way, um, not very good, you know, because they have to deal with this very high degree of these, these instabilities. Um, there are different reasons, but one of them is that when they have each cell, the cell divides, it's probably randomly distributing the chromosomes. So it's not like really nicely, you know, when uh, in normal cells that you give one copy, the one cell, one copy others, this is totally random. So of course they are more vulnerable to some agents. So there is some attempt there. The problem is, you know, these unemployed cells, the way they become unemployed is that they first become like tetraploid or even more. So basically they, instead of the two sets of chromosomes, they have four. And then from the four, they can randomly lose one or other or this one and then gain that one. So they become very messy. Um, meaning like, yes, they are more vulnerable in some ways, but on the other hand, they have more chromosomes to begin with so they can afford to lose more and they still stay alive, so. Okay. Yeah. Yes. No. Is that one of the Spanish ones? Yeah, yeah. 
Nem, de nem, nem, de még nem. Most ezt most mind be van küldve. Ez azt a utolsót meg azt az, az inografot meg most küldjük majd be jövő héten. Um, nem, de van még mint hány.